because when we are setting programs, we don't set one specific percentage because heart rate is very variable. It's hard to stay at one number. So you give it a bit of a range, all right? Um, so the bottom end of this range is 77%. That would be 100, about 149 beats per minute. And the top end of this example is 90%. That would be about 174. Okay, so I'm going to set my heart rate watch or I'm going to just keep an eye on my heart rate so that I'm working between 149 and 174 beats per minute for that training session. Does that make sense? So when you're doing your physical activity log, you can keep track of your heart rate while you're being active and calculate whether that is a moderate or a vigorous intensity level. We'll come to that in a minute. Does that make sense? Another measure that people use a lot, so when you're reading um, in the textbook or you're reading a uh, a magazine or you're looking online another one that's very popular is percentage vo2 max okay. now the problem with using percentage vo2 max is that we can't measure vo2 max directly without very sophisticated equipment so that's, I'm going to go for a run and I want to work between 60 and 80% VO2 max, but I can't measure that while I'm running, right? Unless I've got a, a spirometer and a computer and, right, this is not very realistic. So it's a, it's a measure you'll hear a lot. Uh, especially if you're reading research, but it's not a very hands-on, applied, useful tool in my view, okay? For your information though, you can translate um, percentage VO2 max into percentage heart rate max. They're not equivalent. So if you have a training program that you get given or that you find that says 70% VO2 max, that is not 70% heart rate max, okay? So typically, when we have our percentage heart rate max, the equivalent in VO2 max would be a slightly lower number, all right? So 70% heart rate max, is actually equivalent to 50% of your VO2 max. Okay, so you can't do a direct translation there. But heart rate is a real, I love heart rate. It's just, it's the easiest, simplest measure to use. And it has a linear relationship with workload, right? So the harder I work, the higher my heart rate goes. And it's a very, um, a very accurate, it's a little bit strong, but it's very tightly linked to workload. So it's a it's very useful tool to use, okay? If you just stand up, your heart rate will go up. Okay? If you walk down the corridor, your heart rate will go up from sitting still. Won't go up very much because that's not very much work, but it will go up. Okay. Now, there is a way of using your heart rate to estimate percentage VO2 max, all right? and it's called the Carvona method. And the Carvona method uses a measure called heart rate reserve 
HRR. And heart rate reserve is calculated using your heart rate max minus your resting heart rate. you calculate a target heart rate that is the representation of a specific percentage of VO2 max. And we do that using <coughs> using our heart rate reserve. So your target heart rate is, let me put it here, your target heart rate is your heart rate at rest minus your percentage heart rate reserve. And this number represents VO2 max. So it's relatively simple, but it's fiddly. Right? It's so much easier just to use a percentage of your heart rate max. But as I said, if you have a program that's been given to you, or you found a program that is getting good reviews and seems reliable that you want to try, and that program is written in percentage VO2 max, then this is a way you can convert it so that you can use your heart rate. Question. So if you check your guidelines for your physical activity log, the guidelines say that you have to use a physiological, hopefully they say, <laughs> I, know I, I know I intended to write it in there, so I hope it's there, that you have to use a physiological measure of intensity within your log. Right? One of these two is really what I'm looking for. Okay? Because all the other measures that we have are really based on your opinion. They're subjective. These two are objective. Right? Because your body doesn't lie. Okay. So, a third measure, although this isn't one I want you to use, is called RPE which is, stands for Ratings of Perceived Exertion. And there are several different <coughs> versions of scales for RPE. One of the ones that is most popular is the Borg scale. Um, and again, there is a, another version of the Borg scale that I've seen online that runs from 1 to 10, but the one that is most popular, certainly in the research or in the exercise physiology textbooks, is this bulk scale that runs from 6 to 20. Now, the research says that if you are an experienced mover, right, so you're an athlete or you regularly exercise, you've been doing that for quite a long time, that the bulk scale is pretty accurate when you estimate what your intensity is. Right? So you're going to be jogging on the treadmill and there's a scale up in front of you on the wall and you look at that and you go, okay, I think I'm working at 13. Somewhat hard. Right? If you're an experienced mover, the research says you're pretty good at gauging how hard you're working. And so if you think you're working at 13, you're probably pretty accurate. 
However, you cannot use this scale, you can't use RPE with beginners. Right? Because a beginner, someone who's low active or sedentary, or someone who doesn't have a lot of experience at exercising and moving, is not a good judge of how hard they're working. Right? They usually overestimate how hard they're working because it feels really difficult because they're not used to doing anything. Does that make sense? All right. So whilst it's useful maybe with your athletes and things, although personally, again, I would teach them just to use heart rate, right? it's not very good for beginners. We'll come back. I've got another version of this. I'm going to compare them at the end for you. So I can work very, very light. I'm not doing very much. I can work fairly light. I can work somewhat hard. I can work very hard. I can work very, very hard. Okay. Which number relates to what I'm feeling? Okay. The perception, though, is personal. So you're going to judge how hard you're working. This isn't something someone else can say, oh, I think you're working at 12. Work harder. Right? It's ratings of perceived exertion. Someone else doesn't get to tell you what your perception is. quite a lot in the literature, especially in like coaching magazines and things, is this idea of METS. MET stands for Metabolic Equivalent Task. And so technically um, one for, for each person, one MET is how much oxygen you need at rest when you're not doing anything. So the larger the MET number, the more oxygen you're needing, therefore the harder you're working. Right? That's the simple explanation. So how much harder are you working than when then you work when you're at rest? Average resting oxygen consumption is 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. But that's an average. That can be quite inaccurate, right? Someone who's small is not going to use this much. Someone who's much larger may consume more oxygen than this at rest. Right? So we already start off with something that might have quite large error built in. Right? Three METs means that you're working three times harder than you were at rest, which on average would be about 10 and a half milliliters per kilogram per minute of oxygen. But again, if you train a lot and you do a lot of aerobic work, you use, one of the adaptations is you use less oxygen for the same amount of work than someone who doesn't train as hard as you do, right? So we're, we're making huge assumptions and estimates here on the workload, in my view, right? And I'm not an exercise physiologist, so Dr. Barlow may completely disagree with me about this measure. Right? But I'm just looking at it from, a, from an applied standpoint. Right? I have to work out how many times harder than I work when I'm at rest. It's, kind of, it's, it's subjective again. Right? Am I working three times harder? Am I working four times harder than when I'm not doing anything? And METS doesn't take into account the environment, so what altitude am I working at? 
because the higher the altitude, the less oxygen saturation I have in my bloodstream and therefore the less oxygen consumption I see. Right? It doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for hydration status that can affect muscle <coughs> function. Okay. So it's a good measure to use maybe for a guideline in training, but it doesn't allow for changes in physical conditioning. It doesn't allow for whether it's hot or cold. Okay. And hot or cold makes a big difference to how hard you're working. Right? If you go out to the trail at this time of the year, you can get around the trail and really have to push yourself to get your heart rate up into the training zone because it's so nice and cool. You go out there in the summer when it's 95 degrees out at the walking trail and your heart rate is up in your training zone within about two minutes and then you find yourself having to slow down all the time while you're walking to keep your heart rate in your intensity zone. Right? So the environment plays a big role in how hard we're working and MEX really doesn't take account of that. Again, it's okay if I'm in a lab and I'm tied up to a machine that can accurately tell how much oxygen I'm using, then METS is very effective. Right? But out on the field while you're working, not very helpful in my view. Okay, so I've not got around to adding a fourth column here and having um, METs included. But for your physical activity log, the DHHS guidelines are to try to do 150 minutes of moderate aerobic <coughs> activity per week or 75 minutes of high intensity aerobic work per week or some combination of that all right so we're looking at this okay so 60% heart rate max Anything lower than 60% heart rate max, you can log it in your physical activity log, but you shouldn't be adding it into your minutes for the week. Is that right? Because the log is to meet the DHHS guidelines or not meet the DHHS guidelines, because you need to know that. Right? Because the guidelines are set for minimum health. This is the minimum amount of aerobic work you should be doing a week to be healthy. This isn't about being fit or being an athlete. Right? So if you're not getting your heart rate to 60 on some of the things you're counting as aerobic activity, you need to know that. Right? Because that's a goal you could work towards. And you might do, if you're a runner, you might get your heart rate up above 90. But if you're doing walking or you're biking, you may not, right? But somewhere between 60 and 90% heart rate max is the activity you want to be adding up on your log to say, okay, I did or did not meet the guidelines this week. VO percentage VO2 max or using the Carvonan method, the numbers are a little bit lower, as we mentioned. Right. Ratings of perceived exertion on that 6 to 20 scale, you'd be looking at a minimum of 12 on that scale, but I would really prefer you don't use that scale. 
unless you absolutely have to, for some reason. How many people have a heart rate monitor or a heart rate watch? Okay. Those of you that don't have a heart rate monitor or an Apple watch or a whatever fancy watch there is out there now that does heart rate, how many of you have um, an iPhone or a phone that has a camera on it? Okay, there are free apps <clears throat> that you can get that will measure your heart rate by putting your finger on the camera. Okay, so you can download an app, you'll have your phone with you anyway because you guys never go anywhere without your phone stuck to your hip, right? So you can be walking at the trail or riding your bike, you can stick your finger on your phone and it will tell you what your heart rate is. They're free. The one I have on my phone is free for that very basic function and then they keep sending you messages going, oh, you can upgrade, you can upgrade and you'll be able to do all this fancy stuff on your phone. But the upgrades all cost money. You don't need the upgrades. You just need to be able to measure your heart rate. Right? You, can stop, you can stop and take your heart rate if you want, but it's so much easier just to stick your finger on the camera of your phone. Are they accurate? But there's always error. It doesn't matter what equipment you use or what measure you take or what assessment you do, there's always error involved. As long as you use the same tool consistently, then your picture will be relatively accurate for you. Right? The numbers might not be precise, but the picture will be accurate. Okay? a little bit of understanding about how to use this information to apply to your physical activity goal. Okay. As always, right, if you start doing something and you go, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I, 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 I thought I knew what I was doing, but now I'm not. Bring it in and show it to me. Right? Let me take a look and give you feedback. I can't give you feedback if you don't ask me questions. Right? And there's no need for you to struggle with not quite knowing whether you're doing the right thing. That's what I'm here for. Okay? Alright. So that's it for today then, guys. I will see you tomorrow afternoon.